So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to our passage of Scripture that has become our foundation for this series, Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, but I'm going to do most of my teaching this morning out of the King James. The, re the reason I'm pulling the New Living this morning is because of the way that this wording happens, and I liked how it worded, and it caught my attention. So the Bible says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. It says, Dear brothers and sisters... It says, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is a misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself, refusing to accept God's way. They cling to their own way of, think, of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the few short moments that we have in this service. I pray, God, that I'd be able to translate and communicate all of the things, Father, that you would have us to share this morning. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would have ears to hear and hearts that are receptive. I pray, Lord, that my tongue would be that of a ready writer, as it says in your word. Lord, that it would, that it would be able to clearly articulate only that which heaven desires. Father, where I fail, where I fall short, where... I don't communicate clearly. Holy Spirit, I'm just asking you to correct it before it gets to the ear and into the spirit. Father, I thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Zeal can be defined. Zeal is one of those things that we talk about, and, and we don't use the terminology that much, but it's a great energy. It's an enthusiasm. It, it's a pursuit or a cause or an objective. It's, it's, I have great zeal for that thing. I have great zeal for that thing. I have a great zeal to accomplish this or accomplish that. It's an eagerness, and it's an eagerness to pursue. It's fervent. There's something fervent. The Bible says in another passage of Romans, it says that we are to be fervent in spirit. So, so there's this zeal for the spirit, zeal for the things of God, zeal for the desire of God. And so when we talked about biblical examples last week, we talked about Paul. Paul had an incredible zeal, but it was a messed up zeal. It was a wrong zeal. Paul was doing everything he could to stop what God was doing. Now, he was doing it in the name of God, but it was a wrong zeal. It was a misdirected zeal. It wasn't until he found Jesus on the road to Damascus that his zeal shifted, and all of a sudden he began to be profitable for the kingdom of God. We consider Peter. Peter had an incredible zeal. I mean, that guy, he would, tell, he would tell Jesus to his face, I'll never deny you. How many of you know that was misdirected? Because just a matter of hours later, he did. How many of you know this, that, 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 that he, you know, all of a sudden they're coming to get Jesus in the garden and he lops off a dude's ear? How many of you know that's not necessarily the zeal God's interested in us having? But we do that from time to time. Let me move on or I'll start picking on us. Phineas stabs an offender. David's mighty men, they go get him a drink from the well in Bethlehem. How many of you know that was a, that was a zeal that was probably not necessary? We look, at, we look at Apollos and his zeal for baptism and Nehemiah for a wall. There are godly zeals and there are misdirected zeals. And so as we, as we transition on this Father's Day, I was, I was thinking as I, as I, as I, as I move into this, this series today, misdirected zeal, I, I'd like to take a moment and just spend a moment with dad. And I'm not asking for the rest of you to, to, to separate yourself from me. I'm asking you to just give us a moment for just a moment. I'm going to talk this morning about a dad who had a misdirected zeal that had catastrophic consequences as a result of it. We have to be so aware, so careful. Do you realize this, that, that you can have one moment of error and all of a sudden, terrible things can happen. You know, I was, I was thinking about it. I want to challenge not just the dads in the room, but I want to challenge every single one of us this morning. You know, my childhood hero was my father. Regretfully, that childhood father passed away at my, when, my, when I was 10 years old of an industrial accident. He was the best of the best. He knew what he was doing. He was skilled. He was recruited and elevated and made a lot of money back in 1979. But at one moment where he missed, 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 paid, paid attention, he, he wrongly calculated something. He, he had a, a misstep in his thought process. He stands up into an electrical wire and is immediately taken. Now, he was a phenomenal dad. And then guess what? Shortly after that, my mom met and married a gentleman that she met in the church. 
Hallelujah. I, Gary Keek, my namesake, my last name, he adopted me. I mean, I went from one good dad to two good dads. He's been my dad now since 1980. For 43 years, I can call my dad my dad. And when I call him, I call him dad. I don't call him Gary. I call him dad. He's my father. And some of my character traits and some of the personality of who I am is who Gary is, not Bill. And that's because of the fact of the deposits that he made into my life. Uh, Gary came into a family. Gary came into a family where there was, there was four children, a dog and a cat, a mortgage. And he bought into that. And a short time after that, I got a little brother, Sam. How many of you know that's, that's a special person to be able to do something like that? And so when you have those things, but you know what? In the midst of those moments, I have another hero of mine. And one of those heroes is my grandfather. As a matter of fact, this morning, I pulled it out of my, I, I, I have his gold watch. When he passed away, he was 97 years old when he passed away. And I got his gold watch. I had to put a new band on it because he had sweat through the thing so bad. And, and ratchet, you know, as, as you get older, you get smaller. I guess that's just an automatic thing. But, but his watch, it was always ratcheted all the way to the back. But it was so wore out, I had to buy a new band for it before I could wear it. But this is a watch that my grandmother, it's a gold watch, it's a Lord Elgin, that my grandmother gave to my grandfather in, 19, in the 1940s before my mom was even born. And it still works. It still works, but he was my hero, my granddad. He was so much my hero that my granddad actually was my best man in my wedding. That's how much my grandfather became my hero. So I've had great dads. I've had great fathers, but some of you guys, maybe not so much. Maybe, maybe your relationships with your dads maybe was absent or non-existent. Maybe dad was there, but he wasn't there. Does, do you understand what I mean when I say that? Maybe, maybe, maybe dad was in the room, but, but, but he did what most people did of a previous generation. He was in the room, but not in the room. He, was, he, he, he went and made the money, but then leave me alone, because that's, that's my responsibility. So when I, when I think about dad, I want you to understand that fathers affect more than children. He affects the temperature and the atmosphere of a household. It affects children. It affects spouses. And so, so, so maybe, maybe you're a dad in the room, or may, maybe you're not a, a biological dad, but this is the one thing that I love about the Word of God and the, and the Bible, is I can read through the Bible, and I can see where there's examples of father figures throughout the Word. Paul was a father figure to Timothy. Paul was a father figure to Titus. You look at Elijah, was a father figure to Elisha. You look at, you look at these relationships in the Bible, and they're rich. They're rich with relationship. But maybe you could be in the room and you're a spiritual father. Did you know that you could be younger than, the, than another individual and still be a spiritual father? There are people that, that come into your life that, that maybe you're further down the road with God and somebody, you, you begin to father someone, they might, be, they might be numerically older than you, but you have a greater influence in, the, in them spiritually. See, we're, we, we understand, maybe, but, but, but maybe in the process of, of, of evaluating this fatherhood or this father figure or this spiritual fatherhood, the reality is this. I don't know about you, but there are times that I feel really inadequate being a dad. Sometimes I fall short. Sometimes I make mistakes. Sometimes I don't hit the home run every time. Sometimes my, my kids... You know, they got me a mug a couple of Father's Days ago, and, they, and, and, and I've shared it with you before, but it's a mug, and it simply says this, hey, Dad, when life gets hard, don't forget, you don't have ugly kids. You know, I mean, at least, at least I don't have ugly kids, and you know what? I've raised them to have a good sense of humor and a good personality. And by the way, I do have beautiful children. But the Bible has some fantastic dads. Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11 real quick? Hebrews chapter 11, we're not going to read a lot of this passage, but in Hebrews there are, there, are, there, are, there are names that you will know if you've been in the church for any length of time. There are names like, like, Abr like Adam. Adam. Adam was one of those ones that, that, that he was such a hard worker. And when I look at Adam, I think of Adam as the guy that had the job and the responsibility to name every single tree, plant, flower, every single animal, every single bird. I don't want that job. I don't know about you, but that would not be a job that I would want. Even though he didn't do well with his own first two boys. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
A, Cain and Abel, they, they didn't, they, they apparently, some of the traits of dad didn't fall. How many of you know some of the traits of dad fell short when it came to the temptation? Wasn't a perfect dad. But we can, see, we can see in his nature that he was, in, 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 re, in regards to his failures and his faults, he was still a hard worker. You think about Noah. Noah was willing to live a righteous and blameless life according to Genesis chapter 6. And in, in the midst of wickedness, but he was also one who understood the power of family and blessing. And they were saved in a boat. But you know what? Even in the midst of all of this incredible Uh, fanfare and all of this incredible accolade of building the ark and saving the world. He lacked self-control and some personal disciplines. So, but the, but the, but the cool thing is, is are we willing to finish strong like Noah did? You look at Abraham. Abraham, because of his relationship with God, he becomes the father of many nations. Yet, but in the midst of all of this calling and all of this purpose of his life, one of the things, he was known for a powerful faith in Romans chapter 4. He, had un, he, he believed in the unwavering promises of God. Yet, he was a man that was unable to protect his wife. In fact, he said, honey, pretend you're my sister at moments. How, how many of you know that that's not necessarily the coolest thing in the world to do. I don't know that my wife would go for that. I just don't know. But you know what? Abraham had this ability to trust God when it it was hard to trust God. Uh, How many many of you, how about Moses? Moses seemingly larger than life and his family and the millions through the wilderness for leading millions through the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, but, but yet he dealt with daily frustration. There was one moment in the, in, 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 in the book uh, where you learn about how, how, how he looks at God and he says to God, these are your people. How did you give them to, why'd you give them to me? You know, and, and, but in the midst of his anger, he forfeited for himself the ability to go in to the promised land. But he did lead well. I hear people kind of chide Moses of being a terrible leader, but the reality is he got them to the edge. And sometimes there is someone else that's going to take them to the next level and take them to the next place. How about David? David killed giants. He routed enemies, built a kingdom, and raised godly sons and successors. Yet also he committed adultery and murder. How many of you know sometimes as dads and sometimes as individuals, we have to overcome our past? Sometimes our past can be so weighty and so overwhelming, overbearing in our lives, we can't, do, we can't deal with it. But each of these men had a great zeal to accomplish great things. And there were seasons in their life where that zeal was for God. And then there were moments in their life where zeal was misdirected. And when we look at their lives, we also often try to measure zeal by ourselves, not by this word. But see, not allowing, it's so important, not allowing our zeal to get misdirected is a challenge in light of everything we're encountering in this world today, church. It's something that we have to be careful of. Would you look in Hebrews chapter 11? And I want to start reading in verse number 32. In verse number 32... It says this. This gets to the end of all of the... Con- and I didn't go over all the people that were in there. So if you've ever never read Hebrews chapter 11, you can go through all of those people in there yourself and kind of find out a little bit more about them. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, it says this. And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Woe through faith. They subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness. Say, say, through faith. Through faith. See, through faith, we have the capacity to subdue kingdoms. We have the capacity to wrought or, or reveal or, or, or emanate righteousness. It says he obtained, they obtained promises. Did you know that all the promises of God are yes and amen? I'm so glad that that Bible's verse is in there. The Bible says in another passage that God is looking over his word to perform it. That means he wants to manifest himself. Look at what it says. They obtain promises. They stop the mouths of lions. How many of you know who they're talking about there? That'd be Daniel. All right. But look at quench the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. And out of weakness, they were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. 
and they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Did you know that by faith you can become a man or a woman of God that has the ability to cause your enemies to run, to cause the armies of the aliens, those that are not for you but against you, to leave and be dispelled? The word is so clear about this in this passage. But in this passage, there's another dad that was recorded. And that dad that was recorded uh, had a misdirected zeal for just a moment. Yet, he was recorded in the annals of the book of faith and in the chapter of faith. When we understand that and he's recorded there, there must be some influence. There must be some significance to this story. Even though the story might be lost in two simple, small little chapters of your Bible and never mentioned again, but he's mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the story or the hall of fame of faith. So, there, you know, we talked about people that, that, that they got it right, but then they didn't get it right. How many of you are glad that we have a Bible that lets us know we might get it right, but then in the midst of maybe not getting it right, God can still use us? God can still manifest himself through us. See, as I was thinking about this earlier, I wrote this question for myself to write down, and I said, have you ever made a promise out loud to God in the middle of your zeal to get something from God? Have you ever, you ever done anything like that? We would call them a prison conversion or a foxhole conversion. It goes something like this. God, if you'd get me out of this mess... Anybody ever, ever, ever pray that? God, if you'll just get me out of this mess. Am I the only one that's ever prayed that? Has anybody ever else prayed that? I, I'm just asking because I want to make sure I'm not preaching just to myself. But, but have you, if you've ever said, God, if you'll just get me out of this mess, I'll serve you forever. Or, or how about this? Or, or I'll never do that again. <laughs> yeah, right, whatever. God, forgive me. God, get me out of this mess. I'm sorry I did that. I'll never do it again. You know, the cool thing is, can I sidebar there for just a minute? When you ask for forgiveness, somebody needs to hear this. When you ask for forgiveness, the Bible says that he takes your sin and he casts it as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more. The Bible says he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. It's, it's gone. And you know what? When you come back with that sin again, because you're the one that has the record. He doesn't. He lets that record go once you let it go. But, but, but the reality is this. You come to him and say, oh, Father, I've done it again. He goes, did what? Now, God's not dumb. But he can't remember your sin because he chooses not to. He can't, he can't remember your sin. So, so don't let your past prevent you from your future. Don't, don't let your past affect your present. I don't know who that was for, but that might have been somebody in the room. I don't know who you were, but I'm just letting you know that God says, don't worry about that. I've got you. Or, I, or, or you can say something like this. I'll promise I'll tithe. <laughs> Some things like that in your zeal. Oh, you've been moved by God. Yes, I'm going to give, I'm going to give, I'm going to give. And then all of a sudden, the first of the month comes around and, that house, and that, that house payment is due. And all of a sudden, you're going, oh, I made that promise. I made that zealous declaration, but yet I can't do it. And, and we make mistakes like that. God's a good God, and he's a forgiver of good gifts. Uh, uh, he's a giver of good gifts. But, but let me share this with you. The Lord was, revealed this to me in a, in a, in a, in a word that, that said this. Emotions and words and actions are critical revealers of biblical zeal. Our emotions, our words, and, and, and our actions are critical revealers of zeal. If we are not careful, we'll say, think, we'll say, think, and do, or react outside godly biblical zeal and reply out of a flippant desire. Did you realize that we all do that from time to time? We have these flippant statements. We make these declarations, and they might not be biblical in their foundation. They might sound godly, but they're not biblical because we, have, we, haven't, we haven't laid them before the Lord. See, 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 see we, we try to do what appears right rather than what is right. I was thinking about this as I was writing this passage. And, and if you have your Bibles, I want you to flip back to the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. I want you to go to the Judges, okay? It's, it's, it's back there in the Old Testament, Judges chapter 11. 
And in Judges chapter 11, we'll unpack this a little bit. But, but in, this th- in this emotion, when I'm emotionally, uh, I say things or I reveal things or I do things emotionally. If I have biblical zeal, then my life can be an overflow of joy. See, see, see when my life reflects the, 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 the emotions of heaven. See, see, the Bible says this in the book of Galatians. And you don't have to go there. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. But in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about how my zeal ought to reflect the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit dwells within me. So if the Holy Spirit dwells within me, these ought to be the reactions that I have. Is everybody okay? And so, so if, I'm a, if I'm having biblical zeal, I ought to function out of a, a zeal for love, a zeal for joy, a zeal for peace. I should have a zeal that is long-suffering, a zeal that is gentle, a zeal that is good, a zeal that is rich and full of faith. I should have a zeal that has meekness and temperance because there's nothing against those. And so if I understand that, that God wants me to not have a misdirected zeal, but a biblical zeal, my emotions should match what the, what the previous verses are talking about. If I understand that, I know and I believe that, that, that regretfully, because, because of the fact, because of the fact, well, let me, let me say it this way. Those around us will be affected by our enthusiasm for the things of God and the ability to control those flesh-driven thoughts. Zeal is contagious. Do you realize that if I'm zealous to love, if I'm zealous to be gentle, if I'm zealous to be kind, if I'm zealous in faith, guess what? Those are contagious attributes. We don't want to have contagious attributes that would be contrary to God, but we want to have these emotions, this emotional, this emotion thought process. Did you know that vocally we can articulate? Well, let me give you an example. What? Let me just pause for just a minute. In in Acts, I believe it's Acts chapter sixteen. Pastor Candy, help me, or Pastor Barry. But in Acts chapter sixteen, how many of you remember the story of Paul and Silas? See, see the, the story of Paul and Silas in, in, the, in, the, in the prison, when, we, when they were in the prison, they had a godly zeal. The, the, the godly zeal would be, would be such that in the midnight hour, when, when things were looking pretty bleak, when things were looking a little overwhelming, when things were looking a little difficult, guess what? Their zeal for God, their godly, their righteous zeal says, hey, Paul, I don't know who started the conversation. It might have been Paul. It might have been Silas. Hey, dude, let's sing. Really? What do you want to sing? I'm in. How many of you know that all of a sudden that zeal, it bled over into the rest of the people that were in the prison? And the Bible says that all the people heard him. There was something about this, this, this emotion of zeal, this emotion of love, this emotion that loved and honored God. See, vocally things begin to happen. What a wonderful thing it would be if all of God's people were infected with a righteous zeal to the point that they obeyed, served, and spoke as God did. Now just keep looking forward. Don't elbow anybody. Don't do anything like that. But but how often do we not speak the way God has us to speak. Did you realize in Matthew it tells us that there's a, there's a condemnation that comes. There's a conviction that comes. There's a, there's a consequence that comes by what comes out of our mouth. And I'm not talking about confession, although confession is a good thing. That's a completely different sermon series. But the reality is this, guys. We have to come to this place that vocally we are reflecting. Do you realize that the world judges us by our actions, by our emotions? They judge us by our words. How much more of the world would be changed if we vocally had a zeal for God that matched all the other things we were doing? See, I can have a zeal vocally, but if my actions don't reflect it or my emotions don't reflect it, guess what? My words don't mean anything. Guess what? I've got got a zeal. I've got a zeal. My emotions are right, but guess what? My words don't match. See, we've got to have all of these in play to have a righteous zeal, not a misdirected zeal. See, the last one I was thinking about is this, behaviorally. Do you realize that my actions, I wrote this down, zeal is not an option addition. Instead, is a requirement for victorious living. 
See, my behavior, now this is not a works thing. This is not a thing that I'm, by, uh, lest, lest any man should boast. This is not a works thing. But, but the reflection of what I believe, the reflection of what I feel, the reflection of who I know should manifest in my behavior at some point. And the zeal that I have should reflect God, not my own personal intent. Did you know that uh, people can have a zeal? And, and, and we, we, we were taught this in Bible college 30, 25 years ago. I, I'll never forget it. It was something that I had heard taught. And they said that you can, have a, you can have a charisma that will take you places that your character can't keep you. Did you know that you can have a zeal that will raise you up? But you know what? If your character, your behavior, your words, and your actions, you know what? People will eventually see through the words. Does that make sense? And so, so your character has to reflect the charisma or the zeal that is inside of you. Does it reflect who God is? Does it reflect who he has become in your life? See, this behavior, Jesus saved us to be a zealous people. I want to go back to our story of a zealous dad. In Judges chapter 11, I want, to, I want to read the first couple of verses. You don't need to go there with me, but I'm going to, I'm going to because I want you to go to, I want you, if you have it, you can look at it because you should have your Bible open. But in, but, in, but in chapter 11, we're introduced to one of those individuals that are mentioned in the Hall of Fame of Faith, and his name is Jephthah. And it says this, now Jephthah, the, 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 the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead began Jephthah. And you know what? That's not a good way to start. It's not a great place to start in your life. How many of you know when mom was a prostitute? Mom was, le mom was less savory than she should have been, right? How many of you know sometimes what we look at is we look at our history. Again, I'm going to make mention of it. We, we look at our history in light of our future. And we, we can allow things of our past to hinder us from our tomorrow. And did you know that, did you know that Jephthah, he started off with one foot behind him rather than one foot moving forward. Because, because, of, because of the relationship, because let me prove it to you just a little bit further. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. You know what? When, when, when mom and dad have a bunch of other family, guess what they'll do? Because of who you are, and because of who's your mom, and because of all those things, guess what? You're not, you're not worthy. And they kicked that Jephthah out of the family. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I don't know if that's ever experienced something that you've had to go through in your own life. But as you read that story, here's this guy that didn't have a fair shake at life. Then Jephthah fell, fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. Now, many times, if you, depending on how you read that passage of Scripture, people say vain men, and they think, well, no, this was probably much more like the mighty band of David's men the, when they were kind of out there running the wilderness. It was a, a bunch of guys. They weren't, they weren't a bunch of rebels or, 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 or brutes. They were a bunch of guys that just said, hey, you know what? Hey, hey, you know what? We got to survive, and, and that was kind of how David's mighty men were. But, but as I read this passage, it begins with a man that is recorded within two chapters of your Bible, yet is not recorded again until the Hall of Fame of Faith. Fast forward a couple of verses in this passage, and, and what we begin to find is we begin to find that his people come under attack from the king of uh, Ammon. And, and, and when, when the king comes against him, the, the people say, hey, you know what? We know we kicked you out, but we want you to come back and lead us into battle. He says, wait a minute. I ain't coming back. There ain't no reason for me to come back. You kicked me out once. You remember? They, they said, would you make me the leader of your group? And they go, yes, we'll make you the leader of our group. So he comes back and he tries to, he tries to establish a, a a relationship with the king of Ammon so that no battle ever has to happen. And what's interesting to me, the king of Ammon rejects him at a significant level. He rejects him. Verse 29. I understand. Judges chapter 11, verse 29. It says, Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead, and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah and Gilead, and from Mizpah to, of Gilead, he passed over to the children unto the children of Ammon. So the story goes like this. 
he makes this commitment, this, this zealous commitment to the Lord. But, but what I understand in looking at this passage, because I was challenged this week in a conversation I had with someone, and, and, I, and I, I appreciate how iron sharpens iron because I had to go back and restudy. And I really feel convinced that, that Jephthah, because he was an individual that ended up in the Hall of Fame of Faith, there was something about this man that he was a godly man. And, and, and there's an indication in this in verse number 29, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now, back in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God didn't come into you, came upon you. It wasn't until, the, until Pentecost that the Spirit of God would, it would in, infill an individual. But I learned this, that my zeal must never supersede the anointing of God. It must never supersede the anointing of God. Now, let me just tell you this. The Spirit of God is in you. That ought to be enough. But you know what happens from time to time? We don't feel him. And so guess what we do is we start making promises. We start making statements. We start making declarations. See, the problem is we don't recognize the anointing, church. When we don't recognize the anointing in our life or upon our lives, what we do is we go looking for other things. And we get distracted by the, the, by the pretty things. How many of you know this? I, I wrote this as a thought just during worship. It came to me. We're looking for the spectacular at the expense of the supernatural. What we tend to do is we look for something that is spectacular. We get wowed, and that's where oftentimes our zeal gets off. But we get wowed instead of the supernatural. This dad becomes anointed to go into battle for the Lord's people. And if Jephthah had left well enough alone, but he didn't. Remember, my zeal will be revealed through my emotions. It'll be revealed through my words and eventually my actions because I understand this in regards to the anointing. When the anointing isn't felt, when we don't believe it's enough or, or we can't recognize it, my zeal will cause me to make promises that I shouldn't. I don't know if you're a dad in the room, a mom in the room, a youth in the room, but you've got to be careful with the zeal that you have in your own self. Because look at what happens in verse number 30. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord. And he said, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon to mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth from the doors of my house to meet me. When I return in peace from the, from the, from the children of Ammon, then, then surely it will be the Lord's and I will offer it as a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over to the children of Ammon to fight against them and the Lord delivered them into his hands. Initially, the promise seemed harmless. Initially, the promise seemed harmless. But how many of you know sometimes in our zeal we're not thinking? Anybody ever done that? Our passage of scripture in Romans says zeal without knowledge. We, we, we have a zeal, we have an excitement, but we don't think about it. We don't think it through. What's that word I just gave? What's that thought I just said? And we don't think it through. But what could be the result of misdirected zeal? As I get ready to close, Bert, would you come? As I get ready to close, there's a couple of things that I want to show you here. Because my zeal filled words, promises and commitments, absent or without knowledge can create a catastrophic event. What was the promise he made? The promise was, I will give whatever comes out of the house as a burnt offering. He didn't think it through. He didn't think it through. He, you know, what kind of a promise is that? He doesn't stop and consider what he's done. Now, 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 when was the last time you had to stop and consider maybe something that you've said, done, wished, or shouldn't have said? See, because my zeal-filled words and promises and commitments, absent knowledge, can have a catastrophic event. Look at what happens. Verse 33. And he smote them from uh, Aor, even till they come to Mineth, even 20 cities, and unto the plain of the, vi uh, of the vineyards, with, with, with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. 
and she was his only child. Beside her, he had never a son or a daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her, he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of, of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back says a lot about a man right there. He said, I opened my mouth and I've made a mistake before the Lord. I've made a commitment before the Lord, but I can't, I, 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 can't, I don't know, what, what am I going to do? He might have been thinking that the first thing that would have run out of his house was his pet. I don't know. But who thinks that process through? See, whether I'm speaking to dads or moms or adults or youth or children in this room, young and old, what comes out of your mouth has consequences. You can have a misdirected zeal. You can think it's right. You can think it's godly, but be careful because it can be the very thing that causes you great consequence. When we lead our homes by becoming the biblically zealous people for God, when our homes don't see zeal, when they don't see righteous zeal, they become witnesses of misdirected zeal. Moms and dads, when our homes don't reflect righteous zeal, they become homes and and we create children, we create families, we create job places and job environments where they don't see God moving the way he ought to be moving. But in my observation as I get ready to finish this morning, I thought about something, the end of Jephthah's story. We're not going to read the whole entirety of the chapter. But in the midst of his zealous statement, heading off into battle, now remember, he had the anointing of God upon him. He makes... Just a, a bonehead, zealous statement. But what's interesting is the response of the daughter. The response to me is the, it reveals a lot about that daddy-daughter-God relationship. See, in the midst of this moment, her reaction to her dad and to God, look at what it says in verse 46, 36. My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which proceeded out of your mouth. My goodness, I'm just thinking to myself, here's a woman, a young lady, I don't know her age, but she had to be old enough to have that kind of wisdom. To respond to her father, whatever you've said, dad, that's what we must do. I don't know how many children today would, would, would literally react in the same manner. I don't know. I actually, I don't know a single child that would react in the same manner today. I don't know a single person. But something about the way the father led his home. Even Isaac, I, it, it stopped me. It even caused me to think about Isaac going with his dad, Abraham. There was something about the way those fathers led their homes that there was a willingness to say, God, if that's what it is, then that's what it is. Dad, if that's what it is, then that's what it is. See, dads, moms, are we raising our homes in such manner? It's Father's Day. I'm, I'm talking to fathers for the most part. But the reality is, does my life, does my words, do my actions, do my behavior, do they reflect what this girl is reflecting. How, how about this thought? Her relationships were good and they were godly, apparently. Parents, you have a responsibility till your children move out of the house. You have a responsibility to say who those kids, you give right to what those kids, who they hang out with and who they play with, who comes to the home and whose home they go to. And, and the reason I say that is verse 37 and 38. Look at what it says. It says, and she said to her father, let this thing be done to me. Let, me. let me alone two months that I may go up and upon the mountains and bewail my virginity. I and my fellows, me and my buddies, me and my, me and my girlfriends. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her, com with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. Now stop and think about that. She was old enough to go. How many of you know she was old enough not to return? 
There was something about that father-daughter God relationship that she says, whew, he gave me two months. I am out of here, right? But there was a relationship in that, in that father-daughter. I've dated my kids. I need to do it more frequently, but I've dated my kids as they were growing up. I would take them on daddy-daughter date nights. I, I, my daughters, I gave them their first, uh, first flower, their first ring, their first dress, their, their, their first limo ride, their first steak dinner. Their first, I, I did that. Some dude's going to have to step up to make sure that they pass me. Because until those, uh, but, but, but looking at this story, can you imagine the conversations of those friends? They must have been godly friends. Because if the friends were on this trip for two months, they would have been saying, hey, sweetie, don't go home. Uh-uh, don't, don't, don't do it. Don't go home. Let's, 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 we'll go with you. Come on. But you know what they must have said? Hey, it's okay. It's going to be all right. God knows. See, her friends' thoughts or opinions did not sway her from obeying. Guess what? Her return says a lot about how she was raised herself. So, so as I close out this story, Jephthah must have been an amazing dad even though he had a misdirected zeal. He, he must have been a good father at some level to be identified as an individual recorded in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He, he must have been one of these people that he trained in training his daughter to fear the Lord more than you fear me. He, he, he must have been a God that, 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 uh, uh, he must have been a father that, that, that was a man of integrity and great honor. She could have kept on running. Dads, let me ask you a question. Would your kids return? Would your kids come home? So real quickly, how do I, how do I best maintain? How do I best maintain my zeal for God? My, zeal, my, my, my biblical zeal in my walk for God is very simply just a few things. You have to be, be expectant that God is going to use you. Be expectant that God is going to use you. That, that God has the capacity to use you. Be open. Be open. Let God work through you. You know, in this story, everybody wants to know the rest of the story. Well, the rest of the story ends. If you read chapter 40, the Bible says, or for 39, it came to pass at the end of the two months she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew not a man. Verse 40, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah. They remembered her. They remembered her. So we have to be expectant. We have to be open we have, to be, we have to be consistent, church. I can't be one way today and a different way tomorrow. You know, I, I, have, to be, I have to be assured that, that, that the authority I have leading my home as a man, as a woman, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, I have to lead my home with the authority that's in Christ. My zeal is in Christ, not in what I think might be a good idea or what we think God might want to hear. That's why knowing the word is so critically important. We have to be fervent. I shared with you out of Romans, we have to be fervent in spirit, but we have to also have love. We have to love being in God's presence. This morning, worship was so good. I started to weep when Summer was singing that song. Oh, I know my father loves me. I know my father loves me. Doesn't matter what's going on in this world. Doesn't matter what's going on in the church. Doesn't matter what might be going on in my family. The reality is, man, I love being in the presence of God. So we have to be expectant. We have to be open. We have to be consistent. We have to be assured. We have to be fervent. But let me tell you this, church. It doesn't hurt to be filled. And what do I mean by being filled? Is there a fire inside of you? Is there a fire in your soul? Is there a fire for the relationship with the Holy Spirit? Is there a fire inside of you? 
See, when that fire is a godly fire, when that fire is a righteous fire, guess what? Your zeal will match. If you're here this morning, maybe you're a parent that doesn't have the same relationship Jephthah had with his daughter. Maybe you're here and you've made promises to God out of zeal, but you've not kept them. Maybe you're here and your words and your actions and your behavior haven't reflected a godly zeal. If that's you, would you just stand up? I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. Don't be embarrassed. You don't have that relationship with your kids. You don't, you, you've realized you've made promises with God. And maybe those promises haven't been kept. Maybe, maybe your actions, your behavior, your words, they don't match the righteous zeal that God has. If that's you, just stand up. Just stand up. Is there anybody that's bold enough to make that claim? Praise the Lord. Well, glory to God, I'm standing myself then. I'm standing myself. Because I understand and know that as I preach this message, I preach this message to me, not you. Hallelujah. I see that person that stood. Thank you so much. Would everybody stand together? As we get ready to walk out of this building, I'm going to pray for this brother and myself. Father, I come to you right now in Jesus' name. As we close this service, I believe and know, Heavenly Father, that as I preach this message, it was significantly for me in so many ways. I can have a what appears to be a godly zeal, but it might be without knowledge, God. It might be a zeal that causes me not to evaluate the consequences. And so, Father, I just pray right now for those of us that, that can relate to this story. And we ask you, Father God, number one, that you would cause us to be in right standing with you by just simply us repenting, saying, God, I, I ask for forgiveness. I'm, I'm sorry, God, that I've had a zeal without knowledge. I'm sorry that I've had zeal that doesn't match the righteousness that is in God. Father, I pray for, for, for those of us in this room, Lord, that maybe our behaviors, our actions, our words don't necessarily always reflect the zeal of God. And God, I thank you that you make us right and put us in right standing with you. Father, I ask right now, as we get ready to leave this building, as we get ready to walk out this door, I ask right now, Heavenly Father, for the, the men in this room. I pray for the fathers. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for these men that have raised homes. Maybe they didn't get it right all the time. But God, I praise you and thank you, Lord, that they are committed to serve you, committed to follow you, committed to reach after you. And God, I praise you and thank you, Lord, for the support center of the church, the support center of brothers and sisters, the support center of spouses and children to help us become better dads and better fathers. Father, I pray as we walk out this door, the angels of heaven would be encamped around us. I pray, Lord, that the blessings of heaven would overtake us. And I pray, God, that everywhere we go, everything that we do, God, I pray, Lord, that we would reflect the light and the life of Jesus. I pray, Spirit of God, indwell within us. And God, give us peace in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being at Lighthouse Church this morning. Hey, make sure you grab a donut on your way out. It is uh, donuts for dad, but we, we decided to, to, to kind of change it up. It's donuts with dad. So go grab yourself a donut on the way out. Praise the Lord. We'll see you on Wednesday night. God bless.